Hello, my name is Daisy Cunningham. I'm the archivist of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the history of our college and the history of our collections. And I'm particularly then going to focus on the use of our collections for genealogical research. Um, so just to start at the beginning, um, our college was founded in 1681. We were originally based in the Cowgate area in the old town of Edinburgh. Um, in the late 1700s, we moved to the new town and you can see our current building in uh, the image here. Um, we are based at 9 Queen Street. So in our early days we had quite a broad remit essentially covering all aspects of medical practice so we were regulating the profession to keep out and crack down on quack um, or fake doctors we ran a laboratory which um, researched sort of new medical sort of issues and, and new medical sort of uncovering new diseases um, and also we diagnose specimens for practicing physicians you know specimens from their patients across Scotland but also um, in the rest of Britain and, and abroad as well um, from the foundation of the NHS and various other sort of advances in medicine our role has changed a bit um, and currently really our focus is on examination of practicing uh, physicians um, and also ongoing education and training throughout their their careers so just to begin with with one of our sort of most significant figures this is Robert Sibbald he founded our college um, he was also significant in, in medicine in Scotland more broadly. He was the geographer royal, he was the king's physician, um, and he was also co-author of the first Scottish pharmacopoeia, which you can see here. Um, this was essentially an attempt to standardize medical diagnosis and medical treatment so before you know every doctor would have their own treatment or their own ideas this was an attempt to sort of bring together all those ideas into into one text um, he also was the co-founder of a physic garden in edinburgh um, which went on to become the edinburgh botanic gardens which you can see here um, in its early iteration it was really focused on um, growing and developing plants which could be used in the treatment of patients. This is another individual who is very significant in Scottish medical history. He was president of our college, he was a professor of midwifery at Edinburgh University and he's the gentleman who discovered the anaesthetic properties of chloroform. Um, he did this at his home on 52 Queen Street um, and the plaque here you can see sort of commemorates that and that's you can see that if you visit that that building. Um, he also has a statue on uh, on Princess Street. Um, and essentially what he did was he took various sort of medicines and treatments home with him, trialed them out on himself and his friends um, and essentially saw what happened and it happened with chloroform that they all passed out but they didn't die um, they they woke up and realized you know eureka moment that they had discovered something very significant and very quickly uh, James Young Simpson put this treatment uh, into practice on his uh, patients as I said he was a, a midwifery um, professor uh, this is an example of chloroform that was produced in Edinburgh. Duncan Flockhart and Company, as you can see here, they were uh, widely used to produce all sorts of medications um, and were distributed across across Britain and further afield, but their but their origins were in Edinburgh. This is another sort of more recent significant figure, so slightly to, to bring things up to date. Stanley Davidson was particularly known for his text, The Principles and Practices of Medicine, which was first printed in the 1950s, um, but is still in print today, although obviously an updated version. Um, for lay people like myself, I wasn't really aware of Stanley Davidson, but if you say his name and the name of his book to any medical students, they sort of slightly quake in horror because it's his text that a lot of them are using to prepare um, 
and to frantically cram for their upcoming exams. So I'll move on now to our collections. And as I say, particularly focusing on the areas of our collections that are, are useful for genealogy. Um, you can find out the, the basics or, of what we have if you visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage, particularly on the catalogues and digitized materials section that you can see here. Um, you can search our library and archives catalogues there. You can also see some digitized books and digitized manuscripts. So especially if you're working remotely, um, if you can't visit us in person, this is the place to start to find out a bit more about our collections and what we have. Um, just to explain, uh, in terms of genealogy, um, People obviously consider us to be the first port of call a lot of the time if they are researching members of their, their, their family or, or um, the history of individuals who were practicing doctors. Of course, we have uh, lots of medical registers, medical directories. Um, there are notes and minutes and all sorts of things that can help you uncover uh, doctors in your family tree. Um, and a lot of people do come to us when they are doing that kind of research and of course you are absolutely welcome but what i really want to to emphasize here is that we are not just useful for researching doctors we are also useful for researching patients a huge amount of the material that we hold relates to patients whether it's case notes um, from private practice or from medical institutions like infirmaries and dispensaries um, all sorts of correspondence both with and about patients and um, we have a huge amount about individuals who were not doctors but who were treated by doctors um, and this is really the the key example i want to start off with because this is the collection that we have online so um, if you are unable to visit and if you're trying to do some research remotely this is a really good collection to start with it's called the cullen project it's named after this gentleman here, William Cullen. Um, Cullen was uh, president of our college. He was professor of medicine at Edinburgh University in the late 1700s. Um, he was a really sort of celebrated figure for his publications on medicine, which were used not only in his own classrooms, but in the classrooms of other uh, sort of medical lecturers uh, all over the world. Um, and he did a lot of treatment via correspondence. So a lot of his patients he would never see in person. Um, they would write to him describing their complaint. He would write back with a diagnosis and probably with a fairly hefty bill because these were wealthy, you know, private patients. Um, and he also kept copies of all the letters that he sent. So when we digitize this material to put it online, it's not just the letters that he received, it's also copies of everything that he sent. Um, these are also transcribed, so you don't need to worry about reading difficult um, 1700s handwriting. Um, you can read the transcribed version of them. So this is all online at cullenproject.ac.uk. You can see an image from the front page of that website here. Um, and you can see the sort of um, features that the website has. So you can browse this correspondence. You can search it. If you're interested in particular medical conditions, you can click on those. You can see them on the right. You can click on gout or fever or rheumatism and see all the correspondence that relates to those particular diseases. You can also, and this is what's probably the most useful for the genealogy, you can also, when you click on search, search specifically by people. Um, so you can see here on the screen, you, can, uh, you get a big list of all the people who are mentioned in these letters. So it's not just the people the letters are to or from, but also the people who are mentioned within them. Um, you can search within that for specific names um, and you can see here the example of William Cullen. So not only does it link to all the documents that relate to that person, you can see that on, on the right there where it says docs, but it also has a little short biography which gives you information about them. 
So here it gives you the person's profession. It tells you where they were born. Um, it, it gives you information about where they lived. Um, it varies from person to person as to how much information it was possible to put in. But um, where possible, we've given as much information as, as is available. So that's a useful starting point if you're trying to see if who you're looking for is represented within this collection. Um, and this is just to give you one of my personal favorites um, because there is a huge amount of information in these letters. It's, it's beyond just medical diagnoses and treatments. Um, it tells you about their lives. So in this particular letter, again, don't worry about the handwriting, it is also transcribed. Um, this letter is about Mistress Downman, um, who is suffering from hysteria due to uh, personal circumstances, which is a bereavement in the family. Um, so as I say, it tells you a lot more than the medical. It tells you who they are, what's going on in their lives, where they live, all sorts of information like that. Um, but the bit that I particularly like about it is medical. Um, it says in the letter that you have to be very careful when you are prescribing for someone who is a lady um, who is suffering from hysteria and who is fragile, essentially. So you have to give them a very limited and a very careful treatment as a result of that condition. And it goes on to list exactly what she is given. And I do not know this list off the top of my head, so I will have to read it out for you. She is given gum pills, castor, camphor, Rufus's pills, um, which is a mixture of myrrh and saffron, common nervous tinctures, vomits, tincture of Mars, which is, uh, is made from iron, bark extract, rhubarb, which is um, yet another type of vomit, breadcrumb pills, aloetic pills, um, which, are, which are a laxative, artificial spa water, Peruvian bark tincture, cathartic extract, saline laxative, an aromatic tincture, and antimony. Um, antimony pills were also known as everlasting pills. Um, and this was because you took them, they passed through you, and when they came out, you could rinse them off and take them again. So they were literally everlasting. They could be reused endlessly. So for a woman in such a fragile condition, it's quite an impressive array of different treatments that were, were being given to her. So that was the main collection, which is available, completely available online. We have a lot of other useful collections which um, are not available online, which you'd be welcome to come and look at. Or if you're interested in them, you can send us an email or give us a ring and we can provide you with information from them. Um, so this is an example of one of those. This is a register from the Royal Maternity Hospital in the 19th century. Um, and this contains information not just about patients, um, but also about wet nurses and uh, the sort of the medical staff at those institutions as well. Um, and this is a, a personal favourite of mine. So these are the records from the Edinburgh Public Dispensary. So these date from the late 1700s into the, the 1800s. Um, the handwriting on these is also pretty awful. We are currently undergoing a project to transcribe them and make them available online as well. So that's not complete yet, but, but it is a work in progress. And like the, the Cullen material, this also provides a great deal of insight beyond just the, the purely uh, medical. And if you, if you were at the talk recently about the Kelso dispensary, you'll have a, a bit of an idea about how dispensary records often work. They are often registers um, with lists of you know, people's names, dates, and the, the treatments. These records um, are, are good because these are more detailed. They're also worse because they are definitely harder to read, which is why we're transcribing them. Um, but these are much more like case notes. So these, you know, each patient will have five or six pages describing their situation. Um, and again, it will go quite far beyond the medical. So it will say, you know, how many children they have, whether they're married, what their job is, where they live. Um, and it says quite a lot about their personal feelings about their condition. So it will describe what they think has caused it. Um, 
which is often things such as if they were a harvest worker and they had gone down to England and they, often they would be going on, you know, very long marches to find work. And that was often considered to be a, a cause of their complaint. Uh, exposure to cold was quite common as well. But also it just describes the, their feelings, their concerns, their, their apprehensions about treatment and, and about their complaints. So they're a really fascinating record that provides just a huge amount of insight into people's lives. And they're also important because the sort of correspondence like Cullen's is with private medical patients. So people who were usually paying for their treatment, so would generally be wealthier. Whereas these people were accessing free treatment to spend this dispensary as most dispensaries was providing treatment for the sick poor. Um, so it, they didn't charge for treatment. It was available to absolutely anybody. So it, it provides the insight into a different group of people from the, the correspondence. Um, this is just a plan of the uh, Edinburgh dispensary. It, it was based in the, the old town. The building is, is no longer there. Um, it was torn down because of uh, renovations. Um, but it was quite a, a grand and impressive structure. The difference between dispensaries and infirmaries, um, well, there's quite a few differences, but infirmaries in this period um, were often much more restricted in their access. You had to be recommended by a financial supporter of the infirmary. Tended to be more men, uh, tended to be, although still the poor, the slightly more well-off poor who could afford the, a deposit that might be charged. Dispensaries really were open to everybody. There tended to be more children, more elderly, um, more people with long-term chronic conditions, um, and more women. Um, and they didn't have, they didn't generally have beds. Occasionally places did have emerge, a couple of emergency beds, but generally infirmaries were for inpatient treatment, whereas dispensaries, you would still be able to maintain your life and your sort of family structure, but you would just sort of stop by, get your advice, get your medication, and then go home again. This is just one example, and it really does provide insight into the terrible handwriting. Um, the, 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 the writing here says to have brought it from his gums by pricking them with a pin. Um, and the story behind this is essentially that a gentleman came for treatment. He had a huge array of complaints. He had stomach complaints. He was, he was vomiting. He had headaches. He was bleeding from the gums. Um, and after a bit of investigation by the dispensary staff, it was discovered that he had been called up for military service. And he was discovered to have been faking his condition to be pricking literally pricking his gum with pins to make him bleed in order to get a medical certificate to get out of this compulsory med medical medical uh, military service um and so you can see as this example shows that it is far more again than just medical so this provides insight into the fact that he was called up for military service the fact that he was trying to avoid military service um, and that this was not an uncommon situation to be in um, so this is one that I particularly like because it's one of the rare examples where they're kind of, it's a gotcha moment where he's actually caught out trying to avoid conscription. Um, but there are many, many more examples, um, of individuals from, from these case notes where you get this sort of level of extra insight into their lives. So I'm just going to finish up here. It's just to say that, um, Doing genealogical research is not something that you, you need to do you know, entirely independently. That's what we're here for, is to provide support, to provide advice. If you are not able to make it in person, we are very happy to you know, photocopy things, to scan things, to, to send you images that, that relate to your research. So as much or as little information as you have to start off with, we are very happy to help. So you can email us at library at rcpe.ac.uk. Um, we have a Twitter and we have a Facebook, which are listed here, where we share stories from our collections. We have um, free online events, which, um, which you can find out about by contacting us or by following us. Um, and we do have an exhibition space in the college where, um, when we've reopened uh, post lockdown, where we have free exhibitions on a range of different themes to do with the history of medicine. So please contact us, please get involved. We're, we are very happy to help. Um, so thank you very much.